All right, so uh, I described an experimental program who, uh, where the goal was to develop experimental tools to enable us to study transport of excitations in solids uh, towards hydrodynamics. And specifically, um, what we had in mind are magnonic excitations. Today, I'll continue with that experimental program uh, where I'll show, last time I showed we know how to measure magnetizations and what are the limitations. Uh, today I'll talk about measuring magnetic excitations, uh, a little bit about their transport and in particular about ways to extract their dispersion uh, because some of the hydrodynamic signatures of magnons uh, in magnetic insulators, for example, will be additions or modifications to the underlying dispersion uh, of collective excitations. And then uh, the last part will be uh, a shift towards electron hydrodynamics where I'll talk about uh, experiments to measure uh, the distribution of uh, current flow in graphene. Um, this is a slightly easier experimental uh, challenge to measure the flow of electrons, but nonetheless relates strongly to what is uh, being talked about in this program. All right, so as I mentioned last time, above the underlying ground state, uh, there are excitations. And I talked about skirmions, for example. And here I show some interesting predictions about what might be the uh, modes of uh, skirmionic, ex basically, excitations above the ground states of skirmions showing, uh, shown here. I talked about other interesting excitations that we might be interested in studying. And I also mentioned spin superfluids. Uh, which describes the flow of magnons in magnetic insulators. And you might think that spin superfluidity is kind of a, a new topic, but in fact it's a, it's a very old topic, uh, now 50 years old. Uh, started with this seminal paper by Halperin and Hohenberg, uh, where they describe hydrodynamic theory of spin waves. And hydrodynamics here has a different meaning from the one that uh, is conventionally discussed in this meeting. Uh, and has to do with the spontaneous breaking of symmetry that leads to a conservation. I just want to read this first sentence. Uh, what they write is, uh, a hydrodynamic theory of spin waves is developed for certain magnetic systems in analogy with the derivation of two fluid hydrodynamics for liquid helium. So they, they already recognized, you know, 50 years ago that magnets have a lot of things in common with superfluids uh, and um, I'd like to mention a little bit uh, the consequences of this on the experiments that I'm describing today. So just to form a very heuristic analogy, we're quite intuitively familiar with superconductors where we know that uh, this is a system that has a complex order parameter and that uh, it is described by a spontaneous breaking of symmetry and this symmetry is gauge symmetry where uh, the phase of this order parameter is determined uh, by some spontaneous symmetry breaking. Uh, if one thinks about a magnet, one can think of a similar spontaneous breaking of order where now the underlying order is its magnetization. And if you think about a planar magnet, for example, which is isotropic, uh, in this case what you'll find is that the orientation of that magnetization is going to be spontaneously selected and hence uh, a phase or a spontaneous symmetry breaking emerges. And similar to a superconductor where the current, the supercurrent is related to the gradients in the phase, in a magnet if you had spontaneous uh, symmetry breaking uh, that underlies a specific phase, gradients in that phase will correspond to a spin current uh, of magnons uh, and it would be uh, a superfluid flow of, uh, of spin. Now there are of course uh, differences here uh, we're talking about the flow of either mass uh, or charge. Here we're talking about the flow of spin, and spin is not a very well-conserved property, so there are differences that I'm not going to go through. But nonetheless, the main consequence, I'd say, is if you had a superfluid or a condensate, what we know is that the way we can study this is, for example, by looking at the number, at the chemical potential in the system as we're varying the number of excitations uh, as a function of the number of excitations that are in the system. And what's characteristic of a Bose system is that as the number of excitation increases, the chemical potential will rise, but eventually will not go beyond the lowest possible energy 
uh, in the system because then you can have macroscopic occupation of that state and so the chemical potential will be pinned. So this is a very generic and characteristic property of a Bose condensate. And so we were motivated to look and see can we measure the chemical potential of these magnetic excitations in a magnetic insulator and see whether this chemical potential indeed saturates. So we were faced with a challenge of how to determine chemical potential of spin excitations and here again I'd like to just spend a little bit of time describing the, the physical relationship between the quantities that we know how to measure which are magnetic fields both in space and time and a spin chemical potential. So if we think about these magnetic excitations uh, they're described by some Bose distribution which contains the chemical potential this is the property we'd like to measure and you can think of this number of excitations at a particular frequency or energy as generating magnetic noise. Uh, even if this set of excitations are coherent, nonetheless the fact that they're at a particular frequency, they're not uh, in DC would suggest that they're time varying magnetic fields and we'd like to detect those time varying magnetic fields. And just to remind you, the Envy Center has this level scheme which is rather simple and I already mentioned that if we had noise uh, at a particular frequency that corresponds to the energy separation of the envy center, that would lead to relaxation. So what I argue is that simply measuring the relaxation of the envy center provides a very narrow spectrometer of noise in a particular very narrow frequency range given by the underlying uh, coherent properties, let's say, of the envy center. Uh, and we're going to use that in order to determine the chemical potential. Uh, now, of course, there is a complicated relationship between the noise or magnetic field excitations that exist in this sample and what we're going to be measuring. There are geometrical factors, for example. Uh, I'll come back to that a little later, but you remember that if the NV center is further removed from the sample, then it's less sensitive to short wavelength uh, excitation and more sensitive to long wavelength. So, and of course there is magnon density of states, there is a lot of things that we don't know about the system and so it's nice if we can find a mechanism by which we can normalize all these unknown factors to be left only with a quantity of interest. And what we realized is that if you do two comparative measurements, one is measure the noise or the relaxation rate of the NV center at a particular frequency uh, in the absence of drive, so when the magnet is in thermal equilibrium, let's say at room temperature, and you also do a measurement where now you change the number of excitations in the system. You're pumping it and you're trying to uh, increase the chemical potential of magnons in the system and you measure that relaxation, then the ratio of these rates up to some very simple numerical factors uh, provide a direct measurement of the chemical potential. And note, there are really no unknowns. These are two measured quantities that we know how to measure, the rate of relaxation in equilibrium and the rate of relaxation under drive. And one minus this ratio times the energy separation of the levels of the envy center provides a direct measure of chemical potential. Yeah. But how do you know that uh, without drive, how do you know that all your relaxation comes from magnums? And the other Right, and in fact you can easily have situations where that would be the case. For example, if your NV center is very far away, it's likely that you will be limited by relaxation due to other extrinsic phenomena and not the magnet. Uh, and so we had, to, we had to worry about that to make sure that we're in a regime where we're dominated by the magnet. Yeah, but that's a concern. Even when you are close to the sample, you still don't know that all your relaxation comes from... Yes, it could be some paramagnetic spins on the surface, etc. So yes, it requires some convincing of ourselves, but it's not too hard. But you're absolutely right. Uh, so just a word about how to generate magnons artificially, not by raising the temperature in the system. So we've used two approaches. One is to drive magnons with an external wire. Uh, so we're basically introducing time-dependent magnetic fields by flowing currents through an antenna and this drives the magnet and increases the number of magnons in the system. Another approach, since this is a magnetic insulator, we could use a spin-hall effect where we have uh, a wire here of platinum. It's a strong spin-hall metal. Uh, driving current through the system will not 
pump any electrical current through the system, but will pump spin into the system, and that raises the chemical potential of magnets, uh, of magnons as well. So let me uh, describe these two experiments one after the other. So I, this, uh, this is the dispersion of magnons, uh, just uh, schematically. We have an energy gap uh, that's given, let's say, by an external magnetic field. This could al also be an energy gap that is due to uh, an isotropy in the system. Uh, and then we have the magnon population occupying this dispersion. And in equilibrium, when there's no pumping, the chemical potential of this system is zero, as we know for a Bose system. And if we now vary magnetic field, we can see that this underlying energy gap, which is denoted by this bottom line here, is increasing. This is the ferromagnetic resonance, the longest, the lowest possible uh, transverse excitation of the magnet is defined by the Cattell law, which is this law here. And these are the energies of my NV center, uh, the transition to the bottom, uh, ms equals minus one and the transition to the plus one. And what we're doing is we can follow basically the lifetime of the NV center as we vary magnetic field. Namely, we're basically following one of these lines, either the bottom, the blue, or the red. And this is the plot of the relaxation as a function of magnetic field. And note that when we start at zero magnetic field, we have some relaxation of the NV center. And as we're increasing it, you see that this blue line, the transition to the lowest state of the NV center, is diving deeper and deeper into the magnon population, right? So we're going down in energy, which means that the number of magnons is increasing. And in indeed, you can see that the rate of relaxation is increasing and increasing uh, until at some point it drops sharply. And that's exactly the point where our filter, our sensor, crosses the bottom of the band where we're entering a gap. And in the gap, there are no magnetic excitations, uh, at least simplistically, and so the relaxation rate becomes uh, very long. Uh, conversely, if one looks at the opposite transition to the, to the ms equals plus one, here we're moving further and further away from the magnon populated states, and hence the relaxation rate is low all along. And in fact, using quantitative models to describe the magnet, we can indeed fit this very nicely. But again, the whole point that I'd like to make is that we don't need to perform these fits to extract things like density of states and the filter function associated with, our, with the position of the sensor. We can just do another measurement now. Uh, so this is a little bit, uh, you can't see too much. I'll, I'll describe what is shown here. But now we're driving magnons into the system. So now we're basically pumping magnons, we're increasing the number of magnons in the system, and so we have another knob. And the knob is the frequency in which we're driving the magnet. And I think you can see here this uh, bright line here, that's the ferromagnetic resonance. So this is a little bit peculiar. We're driving the magnet at the ferromagnetic resonance, which is not resonant with the spin with the NV center. And yet we're seeing relaxation, enhanced relaxation. And what this suggests is that when we're driving the magnet at the ferromagnetic resonance, these long wavelength magnons somehow are converting themselves into thermal magnons, which then increase their number. And hence, the number of magnons at the frequency we are probing is changing, leading to relaxation. So we're going to be following this line here and monitoring this rate with pumping in order to determine the driven relaxation rate. Yeah. This is not zero, it's a little bit before zero, and they do become, it's very hard to measure at low frequency, actually, uh, but they are, they are approaching the same value. Has anyone checked the tail balance? Uh, you, uh, we have not checked the tail balance, but uh, it, it, it should work, yeah. It's a good thing to check, come on. So a question about maximum spectrum in heat is, all this is happening at the gamma point, is there a gap? Uh, so, Q zero yes, this is Q equals zero magnons. Uh, this per Sorry? Is there a, a finite gap in the spectrum? At a finite magnetic field, there is a gap in the spectrum, yes. But at zero field? At zero field, there is no gap. If the system is fully isotropic, there is no gap. And this dispersion goes, you can see it's a square root 
singularity here, but it goes all the way down to zero. Okay, so we can take these two rates at different magnetic fields along this axis and different drive power, which basically increases the number of magnons, and look at the chemical potential extracted from this simple relation. And what you can see is that for every value of magnetic field, this extracted chemical potential rises and then saturates. It happens at low magnetic field and happens at high magnetic field, but note that it saturates at this specific value, and this value coincides precisely with the ferromagnetic resonance, namely the lowest possible energy the magnet can support. Lowest possible excitation the magnet can support. So indeed what we're seeing is that very much like our expectation, the chemical potential will rise and then get pinned precisely at the bottom of the band, suggesting that the system is increasing its occupation at this particular frequency macroscopically. And whether it's a true condensate or not, is yet a further question to be answered because for that you want to show coherence, that there is spontaneous symmetry breaking, a spontaneous phase that emerges, and these are ongoing experiments uh, that we're trying to do. Uh, maybe just briefly, there is some interesting physics that we encountered at low drive. Note that depending on the magnetic field, the rate of increase in chemical potential is dramatically affected by the magnetic field. Uh, as you can see here, it increases very slowly at low magnetic field increases faster and this has to do with a process that's known as the thermomagnonic coefficient that describes how effective are you able to convert long wavelength magnons to thermal magnons and this has to do uh, and, and so we have a good understanding just showing here of this process um, that we were able to extract this was in fact the first measurement of this thermomagnonic coefficient uh, that uh, we're able to extract. Okay, so now we know we can measure these excitations. One thing I'd like to do is say something about their dispersion maybe from an experiment and also transport. So this is slightly more visible picture of what I shown before. So whereas before we were driving, we had our antenna and we were measuring close to that antenna where we're producing the magnons, now we're going to be separating ourselves very far. So now we're 30 microns away from our antenna that drives the magnons, we want to see what persists, what lives very far away, how do these magnons propagate. And already note the sensor, we're going to position it quite far above the surface. So in this particular plot it's situating one micron above the surface. So we can be very close but we choose to be one micron above. And this is what I described before, you can see the ferromagnetic resonance suggesting that when you drive at the bottom of the band, Nonetheless, magnons are converted to thermal excitations and you see relaxation because the envy is always probing at its frequency, not at your drive frequency. But of course, you can also drive directly at the envy frequency. So these would be magnons that you're driving uh, that have an, a frequency that exactly coincides with that of the envy center. And you see that there is some intensity here that depends on the magnetic field. And I like to describe this just a little bit. So first of all, we're 30 microns away, and nonetheless, we can use these generated magnons to drive coherent oscillations of the NV center. So whatever is propagating when we're generating these magnons at this specific frequency are very, very coherent. This is in fact very useful because there are a lot of uh, ideas to try and couple spins, in particular for quantum information science, using magnonic excitations across a waveguide. So the fact that you can generate magnons and they maintain the coherence over very long distances is an extremely useful observation. But now let's relate this measurement that, I, uh, that we are taking with the dispersion. So let's choose a magnetic field here, uh, let's say 20 millitesla. Uh, we argue that the bottom of this band where the ferromagnetic resonance is, is the bottom of the dispersion. Now we are driving let's say, the uh, magnons at this particular frequency, at this magnetic field. And so if this is the dispersion, you can see that at this frequency, the magnons no longer are long wavelength magnons. There are some short wavelength magnons. And if we knew the dispersion, we can determine what the wavelength of magnons are. If we go to a different point along this line here, for example, at this point, so this point would correspond to a uh, 
to magnons that are precisely at the band bottom, so they have long wavelength. That's the k equals zero. And I remind you of this filter function that is characteristic of how sensitive the NB center is to different wavelengths in magnetization. And remember that we're insensitive when k equals zero, so that would be at this point. And we're also going to be rather insensitive at very large k, where these energies are large, and large energies correspond to large momenta. So the intensity that we expect in the response along this line here should resemble this filter function. And in fact, that's what you see. It vanishes exactly at the ferromagnetic resonance. It rises and peaks and then drops and decays as it moves away. And D should correspond to this height. So if we just looked at this and we assumed, okay, let's accept this physics and take this D. We know what D is. It's one micron. So this decay here should be something that corresponds to a wavelength k that's roughly 1 over 1 micron. So we're going to you know, just take a k here that's given by 1 over 1 micron and plot the energy that we measure, which is this energy of the magnons, and put a point here on the dispersion. Now let's pull the NV further up. So now we're going to go 2 microns. And what you see is that this extent shrunk. Okay, so now you see the same scaling function, but nonetheless it's much smaller. Again, just heuristically, if you just take this decay length here, uh, first of all, we can just, at this height, we're no longer seeing the thermal magnons because a lot of them have very short wavelength. Uh, so this ferromagnetic line is disappearing, but nonetheless, we can again extract, plot this energy and a momentum given by 1 over 2 microns, and that would give us this point here. And we can go three microns, and you see that it's shrinking further and further. So it's very consistent. And this is a mechanism. In fact, there are others that I don't have time to talk about, but a way of extracting precisely the dispersion of these magnons in the system simply by controlling height. So at this point, we're really at the point where we can try to determine these uh, dispersion relations and look for the hydrodynamic modes of magnonic excitations, but we're not there yet. So this is, completes this kind of experimental program that I was describing of developing tools to eventually study hydrodynamic or interacting flow of magnons in a magnetic insulator. And at this point, I'd like to now uh, move on to describe uh, the flow of uh, hydrodynamic flow of electrons uh, in graphene. So this would be the next topic. And just again to contrast, the kind of hydrodynamics that I talked about up to now was one that had to do with the spontaneous breaking of symmetry and the generation of Goldstone modes, whereas uh, now I'm going to be talking about hydrodynamics in the context of other speakers uh, in this program where we have electrons uh, that can either interact with one another or with impurities and, of course, we're going to be interested in the regime where the mean free path, the momentum relaxing processes, are very uh, weak compared to the uh, momentum conserving processes, which are the electron, electron scattering rates. And we've already heard a few talks about how can we infer the physics of hydrodynamics, or can we see signatures of hydrodynamics from transport. Uh, these are experiments uh, done in Manchester. Uh, and I want to point a few things. So basically, they're relating, assuming they have hydrodynamic flow, what you can do is look at the conductivity in the system uh, as extracted from this Navier-Stokes equation and determine what the uh, kinetic viscosity is in the system as a function of density. And so I want to point out, first of all, that it's rather weakly dependent on density. These are Manchester results. And they're weakly dependent on temperature. So this is up to 280 Kelvin, and you see it's on the order of 0.1 meters squared per second, uh, very weakly dependent on, on temperature. Uh, what we are going to be looking for is to see strong deviations from what you might expect from a Druda type system where the momentum conserving processes are not important, uh, where you would expect the flow profile of electrons in the channel to be rather uniform versus what's called Poisson flow, uh, where you see now that the uh, current flow profile is very, very different from that of the uniform flow. And I want to emphasize that from this equation, there's a length scale that emerges. That length scale is given by the square root of 
the kinetic viscosity to the momentum relaxation rate can also be written as the geometric mean of the momentum conserving mean free path and momentum relaxing mean free path and in these experiments that number ended up being around 300 nanometers uh, and it's a typical length scale where and I'll show more when I discuss the analysis of these uh, of the results that we have obtained uh, it, it, this is a characteristic length scale that tells you, okay, this is roughly the size of my channel that I need to study in order to see hydrodynamic effects. If my channel is going to be much, much wider than this length scale, it's going to look more or less uniform. And in fact, if it's much, much narrower than that, uh, you might also encounter uniform flow. So we'll see both of that. Uh, I want to point out that, in fact, Related to what I talked before about controlling the height of the NV center above the surface, there is a very nice paper uh, from the theory groups at Harvard, uh, Demler, Halperin, and Lukin, uh, that have demonstrated that, in fact, if you measure noise due to the electron flow, basically just shot noise or thermal noise, Johnson noise, and you measure this noise as a function of the height of the sensor above the surface, again, being sensitive to different wavelength, that can indicate whether you have a hydrodynamic regime or not uh, and uh, could be yet another mechanism by studying noise rather than directly the, the, the current flow profile to determine uh, what the nature of flow in the system is even without driving the system. So that here the system would just be in equilibrium and you just probe the noise in the system uh, and you would be able to say whether it's behaving hydrodynamically or not. Okay, so what is the system that we're studying? So we're going to be looking at graphene. It's encapsulated in boron nitride. Uh, and we've done basically two variations of the experiments. One is uh, an experiment that looks, that uses an ensemble of NV centers, basically a large density of NV centers on the plane. We then transferred graphene onto the diamond. Uh, and now we can read out the magnetic field that each one of these NV centers is producing to provide an image, a two-dimensional map of the current flow. Uh, because the density of NV centers here is large and we're monitoring them optically, obviously, we're looking at fluorescence, the spatial resolution of this technique is not ideal. It's on the order of 300 nanometers. And so it's comparable to this length scale D and requires a little bit of convincing to be fully convinced that you have deviations from a uniform flow. But nonetheless, it gives us kind of a starting point uh, and a beginning. Uh, this, this, the structure of the sample you can see here, the blue is the graphene. We're going to be primarily sending current through the main channel, and it's going to be extracted in this direction. And here you can see now an image of the current flow. Just to pause here a little bit and give you some sense about, again, how do we extract current flow distributions by measuring magnetic fields? This conversion problem is always, uh, is, is not entirely trivial, especially if you think about current patterns as magnetization. Uh, and we already argued that there isn't a simple single uh, relationship between magnetization and magnetic field. But in two dimensions, when the current flows are only in the plane, that corresponds to magnetizations that are always pointing out of the plane. Uh, and then the system is uniquely defined, namely knowing the magnetic field uniquely defines the current flow patterns in the plane. This is not true in a three-dimensional system. Uh, and here again, in Fourier space, these relationships become very, very simple. So the idea is that if you measure magnetic field everywhere in space, and you Fourier transform, K is the, uh, is the Fourier, uh, it, again, in cylindrical coordinates, K is the Fourier component, uh, what you find is that there is a very simple relationship between the magnetic field along X that you measure. Uh, here is shown a plot of the magnetic field, the raw magnetic field that we're extracting. This is the magnetic field in Y. And you see it makes sense when the current is flowing uh, through this channel in this way. It's very generating very little BY, uh, but a lot of BX, and in this direction, the opposite. And uh, this factor here, e to the minus dk, again, comes from this filter function. The fact that we lose sensitivity as the NV is above the system, and we cannot detect easily wavelengths that have uh, short wavelengths. And this is a general property of deconvolution, 
we would have to, in order to get these current densities, we would have to uh, divide this function by e to the minus dk, uh, and this enhances noise, obviously. So there's always a deconvolution process that you have to deal with, uh, but it's very, very natural. Uh, one nice thing is that this is a self-calibrating technique, so we can measure the current density uh, across the channel. We can integrate it and just convince ourselves that the current that we're measuring is the same current as we're driving. So 100 microamp, regardless of where we're measuring, the profile uh, is very consistent with what we're driving through the system. So now we take our, our scanning probe that has roughly a 30 nanometer spatial resolution, and we're going to infer these flow patterns. And what you see in this plot here are two experimental curves and two theoretical curves. So let's start with the gray dots. Gray dots were taken on a sample consisting of a palladium wire one micron wide where we do not expect any hydrodynamics. So for us it was very important to convince us that we can see a conventional flow pattern. So this is a one micron channel uh, in palladium where the electron mean free path is very short. Uh, and what you can see is that first of all we have a very sharp rise, indeed the spatial resolution is on the order of 30 nanometers in our experiments, and you see noise. Uh, this could either be real, I, I don't really know to tell you whether it's noise or it's real. Uh, for example, there, if you look in an SCM on this palladium wire, you see that it has some grains, etc. So the current doesn't necessarily have to be perfectly uniform. Uh, but on the other hand, it could also be associated with uh, just this deconvolution process uh, that tends to enhance noise. We've done a lot to try to see whether this pattern itself is sensitive to how we do the analysis, and it doesn't seem to be. But nonetheless, I'm not going to pay any attention to these details. What's important here is that you indeed recover uniform flow where you expect it. The red dots here correspond to the flow pattern in graphene along one of these cross-sections. The different cross-sections show very, very similar results. They, de they, they differ a little bit. Uh, and you can see that we can, first of all, monitor the current flow density, the density of currents, all the way to the edge. And there's no theory invoked here. These are the experimental results. This is just the current density as a function of position as measured without any assumptions built into the system. Now, the theory here are uh, one corresponds to a uniform flow, namely non-interacting electrons with short elastic mean free path. Uh, and the other one, the blue line here, corresponds to the ideal viscous flow, Poisson flow. And I'll talk more about this blue range here, because the blue range will describe what happens when you vary this length scale d that I talked about, the geometric mean between the momentum conserving and momentum relaxing mean free paths. Yeah. What's this uh, oscillation that's in both the palladium and the graphene? That's an oscillation. <laughs> <laughs> right, I, I, don't, I don't know. Okay. So I'll comment maybe a little bit. Again, this is raw data. Uh, this is just uh, what happens. Uh, I, can, I, I didn't put it in the slides, but I can show you what happened at, when you vary the density in the system. And you see that the detail of these flow patterns are changing a little bit. Uh, so I suspect it does have to do with something that is in the sample. But it's the same in both the graphene and the plate. No, this is just a coincidence in this particular case. It's not the same. Because I, I didn't show you the profile at high density or very negative density. By the way, this measurement corresponds to the current flow profile when the density is near the Dirac point. But remember, these are all room temperature measurements. So the firm, you know, KT is, is you know, tens of millivolts on the order of nearly 100 millivolts. 3 KT is 75 millivolts. Um, the DU is set by which uh, underlying the LED and the LED So I'll talk about that. I, I didn't set it here. This is, this is, this is a measurement. Yeah. Okay, because one thing that, you know, uh, could be relevant is that the slip length, namely uh, what is the uh, derivative of the current as it hits the wall, uh, you know, unless, w unless LE is really, really small, it not, it's not necessarily a very small number, so that it's not clear that the current should go to zero at the walls uh, for, for this type of mi mi microscopic flow. Right, so you're referring here to the theory. So I just want to point to the experiment. Yeah. In the yeah, experiment, the, experiment the current the goes show. to zero yeah. near the boundaries. Yeah, yeah. 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 so I'll, I'll come back to that uh, because I, I have some simulations under various conditions of no interactions and with interactions. Uh, yeah? Uh, I wonder what the width. It's about a micron. 
one micron. Yeah. What is the temperature dependence? You can go uh, we haven't done temperature dependence. I think Shachal or Joey will talk about temperature dependence. <laughs> this is room temperature. We should expect low temperature that the graphene also go to the... Mm -hmm. Correct. I think, I think maybe Joey will show yeah. things like that. Yeah. You, you would see that also at high density. Can very, you, very high density. So the density range, density? well, so it's not so clear that you, that exactly is what you'd expect because electron-electron mean free path will become longer, but also mobility uh, will improve when you increase, uh, the, when you change the density. So, so you, you need to be cautious. I don't know what the theory predicts. We vary the density in the range of plus, uh, from plus to tenth, 5, 10 to the 11 to minus 10 to the 11, where the Fermi energy then varies by roughly 80 millivolts, which is still within KT, and that's why mm -hmm. we're not, I don't think we're seeing much of a difference. I think if we can change it, let's say, by an order of magnitude, we might be in more of the degenerate limit, a high Fermi energy and a small KT relative to it, but we've not done that this yet. This is now in the electron horn region. Yes, but again, I think uh, the same results, I can show it, uh, you know, just at the end, I'll, I'll bring up that slide. You, you see very, very sir similar current flow profiles uh, when you're at 5 tenths of the 11. So now you're not, it, it's still, you know, KT is 25 millivolts, 3 KT is 80 millivolts, so it's, it's, they're still kind of comparable, uh, but, but you don't see much, you see changes to the details. You know, for example, these oscillations are not there. Is there a theory for the electron hole plasma? I don't know. Is there? <coughs> for what? For the Poisson flow in, under conditions of electron hole plasma. So when the system is compensated. Yeah, the charge neutrality. So, so. Okay. okay. Uh, yeah. For, for 100 micrograms, what's the truth to us? Oh, the drift, oh, I, drift velocity. Seems to be high. <coughs> so first of all, these were done at 100 microamps. We have similar results now using other techniques uh, of magnetometry where we can reduce the currents uh, considerably so that the voltages that are generated across the sample are considerably smaller than KT. But I, I don't know to answer your number. But these results do not depend on the bias up to fairly high bias. So it's linear, linear response. Linear response, exactly. OK, so there have been a lot of questions about what one might expect. So here uh, is a simulation that one can do just using a kinetic equation. Uh, this is non-interacting electrons. The boundary conditions here have been assumed to be diffuse, which is the worst case scenario, right? If, if you have some specular scattering, obviously you'll get finite currents at the boundaries. So you want to scatter as much as possible at the boundaries. And the only parameter that you consider here is the ratio between the momentum relaxing, let's say electron phonon scattering, to the <coughs> width of the channel, uh, or the Knudsen number. And what you note is that regardless of whether this number is very small, namely short mean free path compared to the width of the channel, you get something that's very flat. Or when this number is very large, namely very long mean free path compared to the width of the channel, you get something very flat. In fact, the, the least flat profile that you might expect in this non-interacting flow emerges when the ratio of these numbers is of order 0.6. And then you see that you get some curved flow, but it's still strongly discontinuous, discontinuous at the boundary where this jump here is on the order of 70%. This is with no, no electron electrons. No electron electron, uh, but diffuse boundary yeah. scattering. So now I am considering various models to see what would be consistent with the experiment. You can take these curves and put them uh, simultaneously with the measurements, and you see that perhaps this kind of physics would be relevant to describe what's going on in the palladium wire, but clearly is not going to be a good description of what happens in graphene. Uh, so now you can go to the Navier-Stokes equations that you've seen already many times, uh, and you just solve them to get the current flow profile with two parameters, and the two parameters are again momentum conserving, momentum relaxing. This parameter d, which uh, is the geometrical mean of the two, uh, and you get the current flow profile in the sample, and you can also calculate the conductivity. And note, they're essentially only two parameters that govern 
the system, obviously, in this equation, and these are these two length scales. And what I'd like to show then is, okay, we're going to be looking at these current flow profiles and just we can consider some of the limits of, these, of this equation. In the limit where this parameter d is much smaller than the width, one can show that this current flow profile becomes flat. I'll show a plot. Uh, and the conductivity becomes just the Druda conductivity. Whereas when this parameter is much larger than w, you get the pure Poisson parabolic flow, shown here and you get this dependence on the width that uh, several of the speakers already mentioned uh, in, this, in this talk. So here are the theoretical calculations for different values of this parameter d, and you can see that when d uh, is uh, very, very small, you get the uniform flow, and when d is very, very large, you get Poisson, and you get everything in between. And what I'd like to argue is that we can't determine d precisely from this experiment, but we can put a bound. Uh, and, and the bound is, if you just look at this blue region here, is of order d greater than 0.3. So this is just an experimental finding. The experimental finding is that this parameter d is larger than roughly 0.3 or comparable to 0.3, very consistent with what Geim has measured in their experiments. Only here we conclude that this is a lower bound on d from the current flow profile. Is it 0.3 measured relative to W or 0.3 micron? 0.3 relative to W. Okay. Yeah, everything relative to W from now on. Yeah. And that corresponds to an LEE of what? Yeah, so I'll, I'll talk about that. Um, so, we have two parameters, and clearly we have a lot of measurements. We have the full current flow profile and we have conductivity, so we should be able to determine what these values are. But it turns out it's not so easy because our current flow profiles are not precisely, you know, they have variations, etc., so we can't really determine D. If we were able to determine D precisely and we know what the conductivity is, these are two equations that would set unique values for LEE and the momentum relaxing property. What we don't have that, so what we've done is just to put bounds. I think this is in the spirit of what Andy was mentioning. It's good to look at things and see whether they're self-consistent. So we know what the conductivity is, uh, and so it's going to bound, so it, pr it provides a constraint on the relationship between the momentum conserving and momentum relaxing length scales that appear within, uh, here this is the mean free path, and here again that's the geometric mean of the two. And so, in the top two plots, you can see what these constraints are for different values of d. So d here, now in microns, but the width of the channel is a micron, so you, this is the rel relative value. So if you look at d of 0.3, what you can see is that the extra, if you assume that d is precisely 0.3, what you see is that the electron-electron mean free path that emerges is about uh, 0.07 micrometers. And in fact, very consistent with Fermi liquid theory that Andy wrote down at room temperature. For the same value of d, the elastic mean free path becomes, or momentum relaxing one, becomes a little over a micron. And now you can choose any d that you want. Everything to the right here is consistent with our data. We can't say anything about it, but what you note is that the electron-electron scattering length will saturate to be consistent with the flow pattern that we see and the conductivity roughly at 0.1 micron or 0.15 micron and the elastic mean free path can increase uh, indefinitely everything being consistent with our measurements. So the point I'd like to make is that while we can't extract these numbers we're certainly very consistent with, uh, with the hydrodynamic regime namely electron-electron scattering length considerably smaller than channel width momentum relaxing processes considerably long uh, and so everything looks like it, it's very consistent, including the, the flow patterns themselves. Okay, so at this point I'm going to conclude and maybe open, yeah, the discussion if there are questions. Yeah. Yes, so what I was wondering is, do you always see that the current really goes to zero at the walls? Because, you know, maybe you would imagine that as you increase the density, you would increase LE, and at some point it would be comparable to the resolution of the detector. And then maybe you won't see that, because... It, the current shouldn't go to zero at the walls unless LE is really, really tiny. Uh, that's, uh, right, so, you know, 
again, there, there are noise bounds onto the measurement. Uh, and you can assume, you know, even if we take the noise to be something that has to do with this fluctuation, and I'll comment about this fluctuation just a little bit. Uh, so you could say, okay, maybe the current is not going down to zero here, uh, but in fact, it is discontinuous, but it's going to be discontinuous by roughly this amount, right? So yeah, there, there are uncertainties in the experiment that we won't be able to rule out, uh, that there is a little bit of a discontinuity. Uh, but it's certainly not one that is consistent with a non-interacting system. That's for sure. Okay, so just I, I wanted to just acknowledge uh, the people who have done this work. You see them here. Uh, a lot of work has gone into developing these techniques and do these measurements. Uh, and with this, I'd like to thank you for your attention. Yeah. Let's see if I can. So here are three measurements. The one that you saw before was nominally density equals 0. This is plus 5 10 to the 11, minus 5 10 to the 11. And these are the current flow profiles that we extract. All at room temperature? All at room temperature. With the same, the same sample. Yeah. Uh, so what exactly is the deconvolution procedure? OK, so there are actually many different ways of, of doing the analysis, all producing difference in noise, but the conclusions are precisely the same. So the simplest thing you can do is to say, OK, I know what the magnetic field at any point is. I take the Fourier transform. I divide by this factor that I was mentioning. I get the current, and I plot it. So this basically, it, it's a perfectly valid way of doing things uh, and would give you something that would be noisier than what I'm showing here. Uh, and the reason is because you're not taking into account the fact that you know already that there is an uncertainty in the magnetic fields you're measuring. You're using those magnetic fields as absolute precise, and you're just converting and saying, oh, I need a current that would produce precisely this value of magnetic field that I measured, even though it contains noise. So the alternative and better approaches are basically to do the reverse and use chi-squared kind of analysis, uh, where you would take a family of curves and say, OK, I'm going to be, I'm going to describe a general current flow pattern uh, using a basis set of currents. And I'm going to introduce coefficients. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to minimize the variance, the difference between the uh, flow patterns that this model is producing with a measurement. Uh, and then you're really taking into account now the fact that you know you're, you have uncertainties in your measurements. And so this typically would give you better results. You can introduce as many parameters as you want. Obviously, if you have the number of parameters equal the number of data points, you're going to be fitting your data precisely, but that's meaningless. So you want less parameters. But this is all standard experimental procedures, let's say, that I didn't bother everybody with. Uh, but qualitatively, you get precisely the same results. Going, uh, going along the uh, line of uh, uh, if the if the key issue is the discontinuity, uh, the size of the discontinuity at, at the edges, can you say qualitatively what difference would be the magnetic field pattern for large discontinuity and small discontinuity? Just you know, at the yeah. qualitative. If I look at the picture. Will I be able to say, ah, this feature in the magnetic field, that is what gives me the, the discontinuity? Yeah. So what is it? So, so uh, I can show you the plots of magnetic fields for the palladium case versus the graphene case. And you'll see that in one case, the changes in magnetic field as you approach the boundary of the sample are much more rapid when you have a discontinuity as compared to something that's continuous and smooth, then the changes in magnetic field that you're measuring are much slower. I see. So, and and you, you have such pictures? We measure the magnetic field. So yeah. you know, we definitely have these pictures, yeah. So um, this is a, some cross section across your channel. Yeah. And if you do different places, does it look the same? Yeah. Again, details will vary. I mean, like so what about those little wiggles? 
Yeah, they would vary. Uh, you, you can see they also vary with density. Yeah. Uh, so thi things change. That's why I don't know to say specifically whether this is real, has you know, real physical origin or it's some artifact of the analysis. Uh, and, and I wouldn't try to argue that these conclusions are uh, valid to within this kind of small variations, even to the, mag to the magnitude of these oscillations. Uh, I think uh, my impression is that these are real. Uh -huh. And they have to do with how indeed current is flowing through the channel. And there might be just a slightly larger resistance here than there was to the boundaries, etc. Uh, in terms of double humps in general, this is something that I wouldn't be too surprised to observe. Uh, we had some work a few years ago with Lonia on uh, the fact that graphene at the end wants to support one-dimensional modes. In fact, we've measured them at low temperature. Now what happens at room temperature to these modes, I don't know. Uh, but nonetheless, you have guided modes that live at the boundaries because of the nature of the Dirac equation. <coughs> And it might be some, something to do with that. I don't know. And, and what about changing the total current, changing the velocity, average velocity? Does that change this? Program? So we haven't gone to the nonlinear regime. That's something that Trond has been doing to go to very large currents. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're always in the linear response regime. So even so these bumps are linear? They're, they're linear response, yeah. Sorry. Uh, you said that you were trying to make a channel comparable to the DNU, yes? But what will happen if you take bigger channel? I, I, I can't tell you what will happen uh, precisely because we haven't done the experiment. I can tell you what my expectation would be. So if I had a very wide channel, what I'd expect, you could see it uh, here. If you had a very wide channel, What I would expect is that you would get a rise, if it's hydrodynamic, you would get a rise in, uh, you would get a rise here that is not sharp, and then it will flatten out. But you'll get a boundary layer. That's what I'd expect. In the car, coming from a longer challenge? Yeah. Well, again, except for these kind of bumpiness and variations. Yeah. Depend on the position along the Here, you can see the kind of a rougher picture of the two-dimensional image right here. Yeah. So this spot here, you might ask, well, what happens if I were to integrate the current here? I would get less. So somehow current is lost. In fact, this is a region where there is a top gate sitting on top of the device. And so the fluorescence is diminished. So we, we can't, this, this is a region that we have an uncertainty, just the intensity of, of fluorescence. An obstacle, you know, very small obstacle along there. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So we can definitely carve, you know, make a hole somewhere and see how the flow pattern, uh, this is all in the works, 100%. Another question, what, um, no discontinuities in, in physics. So what is the width of this discontinuous? What determines the width of uh, Which discontinuous? <coughs> oh, this is our resolution. This is about 30, 30 nanometers, yeah. Which is also roughly corresponding. So the flake thickness is a little bit less, uh, less than that. Because obviously, if, if, the, if the palladium film was thick and you're scanning at some height, then you would smear things roughly on the scale of the thickness of the film. Uh, so we, we chose a thin film as much as we could. And, uh, and this jump is roughly on the scale of our so spatial resolution, yeah. The top HBN, in, so in the, HP, in the graphene case, it would be further away because you have also top HBN. So ah, it's about <coughs> 10 nanometers. Yeah. How close? Yeah, go ahead. And how close you approach to the surface? Uh, we're about 30 nanometers above the flake. That's what our, you know, you, you can, um, specifically from the palladium process, and also if you introduce uh, high frequency if you, if you, in, in the RF, if you, set, if you use your wires and antenna to drive Rabi oscillations of the NV center, you can fit it precisely to what you'd expect uh, and determine a height from that. And all that points towards about 30 nanometers. Can you scan at different heights and from the different scans uh, change the filter function and learn something more about uh, this resolution? Uh, 
I, I, I'm sure you'll, you know, we haven't done it, so, and, and we can certainly do it. You said you were playing, uh, is it 100 in my crap? Sorry? Are you applying 100 in my crap? In these measurements, yes, but now we're applying far, far less in recent experiments, showing exactly the same. Uh, it's not that large of a power, and remember, this is room temperature. So, yeah. yeah. But we can, we can work it out. Yeah. Yeah. And if there should be any spatial distribution of this temperature, yeah. Lawrence. What happens if you turn off the phonons? If you turn off the phonons, lower, lower the temperature. Yes. We, ha we haven't done it. But I think you'll hear some results. This is an effect you turn the phonons. This is an effect. So it is due to OK, so that's what I was trying to argue, that this cannot be explained due to phonon relaxation. Because if you eliminate the electron-electron scattering processes, uh, sorry, wrong way. If you eliminate the electron-electron scattering processes, these are the current profiles that you would expect. You would expect to see a very large discontinuity at the boundary. And even if you didn't have a discontinuity, note, this is what roughly we're measuring. And this would be what pure electron phonon will do. So very inconsistent. Sorry? Uh, so right now, it's about a few millivolts uh, in, in these experiments. Uh, originally, when we were starting, it was larger. It was maybe 100 millivolts, but the physics has not changed. And KT is about 25 millivolts. Sorry? So you could be heating So that's what I'm saying. I think it's not the physics, <laughs> because both when we stop heating and when we do it at 100 millivolts, when we do it at 5 millivolts, we're, it, it's, it's exactly the same the same physics. No, I just wanted to say, maybe what Lawrence was trying to say, that, that with phonons, there are two effects. There's momentum relaxing process, but also if phonons are emitted and then reabsorbed, then it's a momentum conserving process that kind of enhances hydro. Mm -hmm. Oh, yeah. So again, I, I, the, I think for us, really extracting the microscopics is not so easy. Uh, I think the message that I'd like everybody to take home is that the profiles are very, very far from uniform flow. And you know, I think as scientists, we only can disprove various theories, and we can only demonstrate consistencies. And so what these results are, they're consistent with certain models of hydrodynamics. Whether there are other models that will describe similar behavior, I can never rule it out. All I'm trying to say is maybe the reason it looks so good at room temperature is that Phonons Maybe phonon drag, drag yeah. Reabsorb them because of that, because of that effectively LDE becomes much shorter. Yeah. But there are theories, by the way, that compute what the electron phonon scattering is uh, at room temperature when you have different substrates, boron, nitrite, silicon oxide, etc. The mean free path that they're computing is in the micron range. So it's very consistent with what we're finding, just electron phonon mean free paths. <coughs> Emission. emission, yeah. If there is reabsorption, etc., yeah, could be. Just have you made that when you change the carrier density? Uh, have you made an estimation of, especially at very low density, of the of the wavelengths of electrons? Is much even at very low density, the electron wavelength is much smaller than and, uh, your special resolution? Much, much smaller. Is it true to conclude from this that graphene at room temperature cannot be made not to be hydrodynamic? Because even <laughs> when you're on the Dirac point, you're trying to make it the worst possible kind of a conductor it can be, but it's still hydro str strongly hydrodynamic. So is it true to say that? If, if you, I, I would say what's true is that the, f the flow profile deviates considerably from a uniform flow profile. I think it's very consistent with hydrodynamic. I mean, yeah. if you make the channel big enough, yeah. it's never <laughs> hydrodynamic. Yeah. Or in yeah. fact, if you make it short enough, right? If you make the channel shorter than the electron-electron scattering link, it, w it will look uniform again. Mm -hmm. In our estimates, that link, that channel width would be under 100 nanometers, mm -hmm. which makes it a little bit challenging, even with a 30 nanometer spatial resolution. You're only going to get a few data points in the cross section. Okay. Well,
questions? Okay, okay. Let's thank them here. Thank you.